Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead, raise your voices and give him glory. Give him glory. Raise those voices. Come on, raise those voices. Come on, raise those voices. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anybody grateful in the house? Anybody thankful? Anybody free? Raise your voice and give him glory. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Bless him, bless him. Bless him, bless him, bless him. Come on and bless him. Hey, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Indeed, we are free. We are whole. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. My, my, my. My, my, my. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Come on, tell him yes. Tell him yes. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. From the bottom of our heart to the depths of our soul, we love you. We give you praise. Thank you for your presence here, Lord God. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your Holy Spirit embracing us. Thank you for caring for us. We bless you now. Open your word to us. Give us clarity of thought. Continuity of thinking. Accuracy of the text. Help your servant to teach in such a way that even a child would be able to understand the wonderful depth of the scripture. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Come on, say in Jesus' name. Now give God the best praise you can give him. Come on, clap those hands and praise him. Come on, clap those hands and praise him. Oh, hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We certainly thank the Lord for his wonderful presence in this room and thank God for his people and we honor the presence of the Lord. We honor our pastors and elders and leaders and all of the servants in God's house. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord. Smile at somebody say, I'm so happy to see you. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm so happy to see you, and we give God praise, and certainly glad for all of those that are watching online as well. Happy to have you worshiping with us. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are in a theme this year on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For the last several weeks, we've been locking into 
a series within that theme entitled The Promise. The Promise. I've been locking into the fact that the Holy Spirit is the promise that God has made for us and to us. And today, we want to take some time to lock in more specifically, focus in on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The baptism or the baptism with or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do something that I probably have only done three times in the 35 years of this church coming together and being a church family. We'll be celebrating 35 years in October. And uh, it, that's a blessing, isn't it? So I'm going to do something that I rarely do, and that is I want to go back and capture a teaching that I did this last Thursday afternoon at the 12 noon study and, uh, and bring it forward into this celebration today. Typically, I will take something from Sunday morning and uh, push it into the Bible study. But we're doing the reverse. We're taking something that was in the Bible study and pushing it into the Sunday morning celebration. And you that were here Thursday at 12 noon, you understand why we are doing it. Because uh, it's, it's just some revelation. Even as I was teaching at the first celebration today, there was more revelation coming. And I said, Lord, this is good. Just keep opening it up for us, God. Keep showing us more and more what you're doing here. Now, I will tell you, for some of you hearing what you're going to hear today, it's going to come as a culture shock to you, a church culture shock, because some of us have been raised in some traditions and backgrounds that you've heard certain things, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be in the Bible, but you believed it and ran with it, and you just have believed it. Uh, not so here. We want to know what's, what does the Word say? What does the word say? Now, what is our cultural background, our religious cultural backgrounds? But what does the word of God say to us? So let's pick it up here, beginning at uh, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. I'm reading from the ESV. Notice what it says. For in one spirit, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The word spirit there is capitalized as to denote the Holy Spirit. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. I'm going to read that one more time. For in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, we were all, how many? All, all baptized into one body. Uh, here it says Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free. We could say we were all baptized into one body. Uh, whether you be white, black, red, yellow, you know, uh, Baptist, Methodist, Church of God in Christ, Church of God, Church of Christ, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Church of God, Indiana, Assembly of God, Apostolic, huh? Apostolic, I said it right, Apostolic. See, we were all baptized into one body. One body, not, not all splintered up like folks try to do. We were baptized, whether you up in here or whether you are watching online, whether you're in Sacramento, whether you're in the Heights, whether you're in North Highlands, Greenhaven, Meadowview, Granite Bay, Lincoln, we got a woman in here, drives every Sunday an hour and a half all the way from Fremont. <laughs> Three hour round trip, depending on traffic. We got a man who comes to the next celebration, drives all the way from Reno every week to be sitting here. 
We were all baptized into one body by one spirit. The word baptized here comes from a Greek word that we often reference, and it is the word baptismo. Baptismo, if you're taking notes, it's spelled B-A-P-T-I-Z-O, baptismo. And the, defi- the definition of baptismo is that of to dip, to immerse, or to sink. To dip, to immerse, or to sink. And there's another word or another definition that is often overlooked from the word baptismo, and that is to cleanse or to purge, to cleanse, to purge. So here he says, we were all baptized into the body. What body? The body of Christ. The body of Christ. And who baptized us into the body? Uh, the, 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 the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's pretty clear here that we could not have come into the body of Christ except the Holy Spirit baptized us. Are you, are you following it? There's no way you and I could have been saved except the Holy Spirit saved us and brought us in. Let me, let me put it this way. I, no matter where you received Christ, whether it was at a school, whether it was on your job, whether it was in a house, whether it was coming down the aisle of a church, whether it was standing outside on the street and someone led you to Christ, there would be absolutely no way that you would have been able to say, Lord Jesus, and mean it from your heart, come into my life, had the Holy Spirit not come upon you and baptized you that day. You didn't just jump up and say, I want to be saved. The Holy Spirit came upon you and he enabled you. He enabled me to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. For me, I was seven years old at Shiloh Baptist Church on Ninth Avenue, right in the middle of Oak Park. I remember it vividly. Vividly, I remember sitting there and hearing Pastor Willie P. Cook preach the word of God and talk about the goodness of Jesus. And I remember all of a sudden as a seven-year-old, I started crying, tears running down my face. Don't ever underestimate how God deals with our babies. And I was sitting there hearing the message of the kingdom and the message of the gospel. And the choir started singing the song, Just As I Am. And everybody was standing up, and I was sitting there next to my mother, and I was sitting there, and I said, I want to receive Jesus. Now, I knew that there had to be someone besides myself that was touching my heart. And I looked, my mother said, what's wrong? And I said, I want to receive Jesus. And she said, well, go on up. Go on up. Act like, you know, kind of like Price is Right. Come on down, you know. (laughs) Go on down there. And I got scared because there were a lot of people that were in that church. Place was packed. Back then, Shiloh, you had to get there early. You couldn't even find a seat. About as many people as sitting in this first section right here. All across here. And I was sitting there, and my mother said, you want to go up? I said, no, no, I'm scared. So she put her hand on me, and her intent was to guide me up, but she didn't realize how heavy-handed she was. (laughs) And I was sitting at the edge of the pew, and when she took her hand, she kind of shoved me, and I ended up landing on the middle of the aisle on the floor. And I was too intimidated to go back to my seat, so I just kept on walking. I tell people I got saved by default. And I walked up, and I remember 
that Sister Howard was standing there and Deacon Howard was standing there and Pastor Cook was standing there. And they were standing there and they were taking notes and writing things down. And, and uh, Sister Moten was sitting there and she was writing it down. And she said, what did you come up for? I said, I want to receive Jesus. And, and, and I asked the Lord to come into my life. And that night, it was the first Sunday, that night they baptized me. That night. That night, I asked the Lord to come into my life. That night, at the age of seven, I was brought into the body of Christ. Oh, you can't take that away from me. I know I was brought into the body of Christ. There's other religious traditions that try to add a whole lot of other stuff on top of that. They try to say, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, and you got to do that. But I know what I know what I know what I know, that that day that God did a change on the inside of me and his spirit was upon me. That's what he's saying here. Don't care who you are. You've been baptized into the body of Christ. That's why there's a distinction when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And what we'll talk about next time is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That day, I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brought me into the body. But it was at the age of 17, a subsequent experience took place. I was sitting there and uh, in the middle of the field at Foothill High School, in the middle of the baseball diamond, everybody had gone to lunch. And I felt the Lord tugging at my heart. And I knew there was a call of God that was on my life. But I knew that I couldn't do it by myself. And so while I was sitting there in that baseball diamond, I said, Lord, I thank you that I'm saved. I thank you that your spirit is upon me. I thank you, Lord, for the call of God. But I need some power. I need to know that you are the infiller, that God, your Holy Spirit doesn't just want to be on me, but your Holy Spirit wants to flow out of me so that I can do. See, I could have gone to heaven at the age of seven by receiving Christ and having the baptism on me, but in order to do the work of the kingdom, I needed there to be something to happen on the inside that would give me power so that I could go and do the work of the kingdom. So I received the baptism and the infilling. And here's the thing. The infilling, the baptism is one and done. The infilling is every day. Y'all missed it. I'm, I'm going to go a little slow right there. The baptism of the Holy Spirit on me is one and done. I know I'm going to heaven. I, I, okay, let me try this side. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I have a relationship with God. I know the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians, has sealed me until the day of redemption. I know that I know. I know that Jude lets me know now unto him who is able to keep me from falling. And in that day, present me faultless. It's done. Is done. I'm not worried about going into the world and backsliding and losing my salvation. I'm in. Glory to God. I'm not scared. Come on. I'm not scared and walking in fear because he's not giving me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and soundness of mind. I couldn't save myself, and I can't keep myself saved. I lost you right there, didn't I? You can't keep yourself saved. The Holy Spirit had to seal me and lock me in. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit had to make me right with God. I can't make myself right with God. Glory to God. I do too much mess up. I mess up too much. I do too much craziness. So I need something that is stronger than me, something that is greater than me, that keeps me sealed and locked in to the things of God.
Come on, tell somebody, I say, I'm baptized into the body. Tell somebody else, I'm baptized into the body. Glory to God. Matthew 3, I like that. Go and help me preach this thing. All sealed up. Matthew 3, go there with me, and I'm going to break this down because we're going to break some myths here today. Mm-hmm. Matthew 3, look with me over here, and let's, let's see what happens here. Watch this. Watch this. In those days, John the Baptist, he ain't called the Baptist because that's his denomination. <laughs> that was the case they could have said John the Methodist John the Church of God in Christ had nothing to do with a denomination it had to do with what he did he baptized he was a baptizer in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea repent here's what he preached for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Matthew says, when Isaiah said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Notice here that Matthew gives us some insight prophetically that Isaiah spoke of John the Baptist who would be the forerunner, who would come before Jesus. And notice here, he preached this, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Make his paths straight. In other words, don't cause there to be a deviation within the path with your crooked thinking. Make his path straight so that he might have entryway and direct access without going through all of the foolishness that you try to put him through and the, the ropes and the legalism. Make his path straight. Don't be a hindrance. Don't be a roadblock. Make his path straight. Prepare, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, watch this. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice the whole region. But when he saw many, here it is, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, doesn't say they came to be baptized. They were coming to his baptism. He said to him, notice his preaching, notice what it ships. He says, you brood of vipers. That means snakes, y'all. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Come on, let's unpack this a little bit. Notice here that we're introduced to this John the baptizer. And notice here, Matthew gets commentary and says he is the one that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. And he would be the one who would be the forerunner that would come before and declare and proclaim there is someone who's coming. There's someone who's, a, who's coming who is before us. And it would be shortly after this account that that someone would come. In fact, while John would be preaching, there would be a day that he would look and he would see Jesus coming to the waters to be baptized. And he would say, behold, the one who comes to take away the sins of the world. John knew he was not the one who could take away the sins. 
All the prophets knew they were not the one who could take away the sin. It had to be someone who would come and shed their blood. It had to be someone who was willing to make the atoning sacrifice before God the Father so that God would accept the sacrifice. Nothing that would ever come before God can ultimately cover the sins of the people. Every time they tried to bring the blood of the lambs, every time they tried to bring the blood of the doves, it would only last for a while and they would have to go back and repent repeat it again. But once Jesus came and Jesus became the sacrifice, that blood still works. Come on, look at somebody. Tell somebody the blood still works. That blood was poured out. But then it goes on to say that all of Jerusalem, all of the people of Judea, that means a whole lot of folk, y'all. People from all of the region came out to hear the preaching of the word. Can I say something to you? We need preaching like that today. I'm going to say it again. We need some preaching like that today. We need some preaching that can draw people out to come hear the word of God. We need more preaching that would cause people to come not to hear an ideology, not to hear people's tradition, not to hear religion, but we need people to hear the good news of the kingdom, the good news of the gospel. That's why I really can't get with folks that say, well, you know that people don't really want to come and hear the word of God anymore. People don't really want to hear the gospel anymore, and they give an excuse and a smoke screen for why their churches remain small and why nobody wants to come to their church. Could it be that nobody wants to come to your church not because you are preaching something they don't want to hear, but you're not preaching the gospel. You're not preaching the good news. You're not preaching the kingdom. You're preaching your religion. You're preaching your tradition. Could it be? When I was coming up in the church, we used to talk bad about big churches. We used to say the only reason why it's big is because ain't nobody living right. The devil is alive. I think I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of folk that are up in here that have made up your mind I'm on the Lord's side. I'm going to serve God with all of my heart and all of my Just stop lying. You don't want to grow. You glad with your 10 family members. He's preaching and the folks are coming out. The people are coming to hear the word. The people are coming to hear the message. And notice when he's preaching, guess who else show up? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the oppressors of the people, the people that come to be religious minded and they always got their foot on somebody's neck in the name of gospel or in the name of church. They don't want to see people be whole. They don't want to see people be free. They want to develop people who are dependent upon them. You are, ah, every, you, everybody ain't your armor bearer. Everybody, come on somebody. I know you got a call, but you mean you got to have an armor bearer just to go to Rayleigh's? That might be a form of control. You understand what I'm saying? You don't need, everybody don't need an armor bearer to go everywhere with you. But the moment people begin to think free, the moment people begin to think delivered, the moment people begin to think whole, then all of a sudden, insecure preachers, insecure churches, insecure leaders, all of a sudden, everybody, everybody's a problem. Everybody's going to hell. No, it's that nobody wants to be controlled under the thumb of religion. The Pharisees, the Sadducees are still in the church today. Pharisees don't come to get baptized. They come to be critical. The Sadducees don't come 
to say, praise God. Come on, saints. Listen, they come to criticize everything. I don't like the song they sang today. I don't like when Julian leads worship. I don't like when they wear them colors. I don't like this. I don't like, why is preaching, why is Dr. Harris up doing the offering and Bishop not doing the offering? Something is wrong. I don't like when Dr. Harris does the offering because he take too long. He really don't. He take too long to do the offering. It's all of this. Is there anybody that came in here today not to cross your arms and fold your legs and roll your eyes and criticize, but came here to hear a word from the Lord, came here to add something to the celebration, came here to uplift somebody else? Let's slow it down. Let's slow it down there. See, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and they were criticizing. And I, I'm going to have to, I, I got to say this. I like John the baptizer. He's a man's man. He don't play with them folk. Because see, others are, we so soft-spoken. Well, you know. If the Pharisees had come up and Sadducees and they'd be all critical, you know, it ain't for everybody. It ain't for everybody, you know. It's not, it's just not. You know, you just have to. <laughs> John don't play with them folk. John, he gets rushed and cuts the chain. It ain't for you. You snakes. Uh, come on, I wish he had some more narrative. It's like slithering snakes. You belly dirt <laughs> dragon. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, we just got the King James Version, but he, you dirt eating belly dragon <laughs> slithering Look what he says. He says, you're snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He says, listen, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, he says, if you came here with the right spirit, if you came here with a heart that was open to God and not being critical, you would start bearing some fruit. There would be some productivity to your life. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And notice here, and do not presume to say to yourself, we are Abraham's father. Abraham is our father, rather. We, we are the children of Abraham. Abraham is our daddy. I've been a deacon in this church for 35 years. This church don't move until I move. Lovelace better know it. If I'm out, one third of the church is out. There's people think like that. There's people think like that. Ah, ah, ah. He better be glad I'm here. That's, that's the mentality. That's the mentality. That's the mentality. He says, you don't bear fruit of repentance. You caught up and you presume that your pedigree brings you in. You can't enter the kingdom just because your grandmama loved Jesus. Just because you were brought up in a church building does not mean you are in the kingdom of God. Don't presume. Don't presume. Because you start presuming, then when God brings people in who don't know nothing about your religious traditions, they don't know nothing about when to stand and when to sit down. 
They don't know what to, all they know is, is they love God with all of their heart. All that they know is that God brought them out of darkness into light. All they know is that God is doing a work on the inside of them. And you're going to sit here and roll your eyes and look all around. You better understand when God gets a hold of these men and women that he's bringing into the church today, they don't look like church folk. They don't smell like church folk. They come in here, y'all, toe up from the flow up. But all they know is that work is happening on the inside of them. And all they know is there's a change that is taking place. Come on and give God a praise. Don't think because you've been here all these years that you got it made. I got about 10 of y'all that realize I'm still growing. Come on, look at somebody say, God is still growing me up. Come on, some of you say, I've been here a long time, but I'm still learning some things. I'm finding out some things about God I never knew. I'm growing in my walk. I'm getting stronger. Then he goes uh, and he throws a curveball at him. He throws a curveball at him. He says here, don't presume that you have Abraham as your father. For I tell you, God is able. Come on, tell somebody, God is able. God is able. From these stones to raise up children. Children. For Abraham. He says to the religious folk, keep your mind, Pharisees, Sadducees, religious folks, unbelievers, don't plan to believe. They didn't come to believe. That's to me. Can I put a pause on that? It's crazy to me if you don't come to receive and to believe, why are you wasting your time? You can stay at home. You can tune out. Why are you wasting your time if you don't plan to believe? You don't plan to contribute to the ministry, to the people of God? You don't come to bless the people? Do, could it be that you just simply want to come to be in a building and say you in the church? Okay, so God is able to touch the stone and bring the stones into relationship. I imagine John went and literally picked up some stones and held them up. He says, why y'all tripping? God can take these stones and do something that's going to bring some praise out. See, this, this is for the religious folk. The folk come in, I don't like that song, so I'm not going to clap. Don't. I don't like all of this noise and all of this loud mess, all of this worship. And I, 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 that ain't me. I ain't gonna. Don't. Don't. Sit right there. And while you're sitting there, there's somebody sitting in front of you or behind you that will say, I came here. Because just this week, God broke an addiction off of my life. Just this week, when I was going through the worst thing in my life, God put some joy down on the inside of me. And I came to lift up the name of Jesus. I came to bless the Lord. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I didn't came to look at you. And don't you sit there and look at me. But tell them if the Lord's done anything for you. Give God the best praise you can give. Hey, come on, tell somebody. I know where the Lord has brought me from. Oh, I know where he's brought me from. God will raise up some stones, y'all. God will raise up some stones. You ain't got to praise. Just sit right there. 
Look, just look around. I wonder how long they painted this building. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. Look at verse 11. Now listen, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. Now watch this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. He, when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Stop right there. When he comes, he said, there's one coming while y'all tripping over here and while y'all are believing over here. While y'all are believing and being baptized and bearing fruit of repentance, and while you over here, the religious folks are tripping and doing all the things you're doing and don't have any good fruit, God is doing a work, and he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to come and do some baptizing. And he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, watch this. All my life, I've been reading that passage all my life. And I grew up in a background, Pentecostal background, where we took that scripture literally. In fact, that was part of our testimony. I'm, I'm Holy Ghost filled. I'm fine. <laughs> Baptize. He baptized me with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In fact, we even put a little additive, uh, mighty burning fire. <laughs> Come on, some of y'all in the same churches. Come on. Yeah, yeah. With the Holy Spirit and with fire. I got to ask you a question. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to ask you a question. Does the Holy Spirit come to baptize the believer? That means come upon the believer. Does he come to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire? That's what people said. You, come on. I, I, yeah, some of you ain't even saying nothing. I'm just going to wait to see what Bishop said because you ain't going to put me out there like that. I'm going to wait to see what it says. I might have missed the first celebration, but I ain't going to miss this. Does he come to baptize the believer with the Holy Spirit and the believer with fire? I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Why do you say that? Here you go. This is the key. This is the key. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you the answer to the test. He was talking. John was talking to a mixed audience of people. He was talking to believers and unbelievers. He was talking to the ones who came to receive and the ones who rejected. And beloved, for the believer, he does not come to baptize you with fire. Because if he came to baptize you with fire, you fall into the category of verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit. What fruit? The fruit of repentance is cut down and thrown into the fire. He says when Jesus comes, there's going to be two baptisms. When Jesus comes, he's going to baptize the believer with his spirit. But the unbeliever is going to be baptized. The one who rejects the gospel will be baptized with fire. Children, you don't want to be baptized with fire. You want to be baptized into the body. You want to be baptized into the body of Christ by his spirit. Now, y'all still looking at me like Alice in Wonderland. Well, let me keep reading to you. Notice here in verse 12, he says, here it is. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff, 
he will burn with unquenchable fire. In other words, when the Spirit comes, he's coming to separate the ain'ts from the saints. He's coming to separate the phony from the real. He's coming to separate those who are playing church and those who are the church. He's coming to separate the looky-loos and those who mean Jesus for real. He's coming to separate some things. And he says, the chaff, that's the bad stuff. The chaff is going to be burned. Come on, come on, y'all, look at me. With unquenchable fire. I don't want my works to be burned. Whatever I do for the kingdom of God, I want it to have some fruit. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I want some fruit in my preaching. I want some fruit in my singing. I want some fruit in my ushering. I want some fruit in my witnessing. I want some fruit in my praying. I want some fruit. I don't want to be known as the center of chaff. I want some fruit. I want some fruit. I want God to be pleased. Pleased with my life. Come on, children. I want God to look at me and say, look at my son. Don't you want him to say, look at my daughter. Everything she's been through, she's still blessing me. She's still glorifying God. Everything he's going through, he's still giving God praise. He's still loving God. I want some fruit. Glory to God. So you want to be baptized with the Spirit. Remember, it was a mixed audience. Two different types of folks, believer and unbeliever. Any believers in the house? Are there any believers in the house? I'm going to give you one more, then I'm going to go. It's funny how we take scriptures and really, we don't even take scriptures. We make up stuff. <laughs> if you just read it, you ain't got to make it up. John 16 and 8. Let me read this and we're going to go. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin. Because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Three things I leave with you. Three things. Jesus is sitting there speaking to his disciples, and he says to them, I'm going away. I'm going away, but I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send the advocate. I'm going to send the one that's going to guide you and lead you. He says, now, I got to go, because if I don't go, he won't come. You got it? He won't come if I don't. Now, watch this. Watch this. Let me use you, Pastor, like I did in first celebration. So all this time. Jesus is sitting there walking with his disciples. Everything they needed, Jesus gave to them. They needed food, he fed them. They needed clothing, he provided for them. They didn't have to look anywhere outside of Jesus because everywhere Jesus was, they, he, they were with him, right? Now Jesus turns around and one day just take them, just throws them off because all this time he'd been with them, all this time. They didn't have no problem. And they were like, this is cool. Just stay like this. This is wonderful. And they just walking with him. And just Jesus just walking with them. And they just going back. Just going back. Now all of a sudden, Jesus shifts gears and says, Now, I am going away. I'm, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. And they, about this time, they're looking at Jesus like, what in the world are you talking about? You understand? So Jesus turned around and he said, I'm leaving you. I'm going away. Now, I have to go. Because you remember there's accounts where they were saying, Jesus, please don't go. Please, please, please. please. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it wasn't because they wanted Jesus just to stay. They were wondering where that food was going to come from. You understand what I'm saying? So... 
We were, we were doing some good vittles, all the fish you can eat. I mean, he did a fish fry, and I mean, come on here. We're going to miss that. And so then Jesus said, but I got to go. If I don't go, he won't come. The helper. So Jesus leaves them, and they're going on about their business. And Jesus leaves them. And here's the question. Where did Jesus go? Glad you asked. Jesus ascends to the Father. And he leaves them physically. No longer is he walking with them. No longer is he talking with them. No longer is he feeding them. Jesus goes and he sits down at the right hand of the Father. And he's sitting there right now. But Jesus made a promise. If I go, he'll come. I'll send him the Holy Spirit. The helper will come too. So Jesus looks over to the Holy Spirit and said, Tag, you it. And the Holy Spirit comes in and comes alongside the believer. But watch this. He doesn't just come to the believer to walk with him as to baptize him. But Jesus said he not only will be with you, but he's going to be in you. And everything I did, you'll do. You won't have to worry about somebody feeding you because the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom and show you where the miracle is, where the fish is, where the blessing is. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. Somebody say, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Now I got to go. My time is well up, but watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. All my life, I have preached, heard others preach. The Holy Spirit comes to convict you of sin. He comes to convict the believer of sin. Y'all ever heard that? The Holy, they, they say that. The Holy Spirit, whenever you sin, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction of sin. Well, that ain't what that Bible says. In fact, nowhere in the Bible does it say the Holy Spirit will come and convict the believer of sin. He convicts the world or the unbeliever of sin so that that brings you into receiving Christ. But once you are a believer, the Holy Spirit don't come to convict you of sin. He comes to convict you of righteousness. Oh, I miss you. missed it. You missed it. When I mess up, notice that I say if I mess up. When I sin, I didn't say if I sin. This is for the religious folks. I've been saved all day. No evil have I done. You just did. You lied in church. When I mess up, the Holy Spirit does not come to convict me of my mess up. He comes to convict me of the righteousness. He reminds me that I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. He reminds me. You ain't got to live like that anymore. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You ain't got to shack up, smoke up, sleep around, party all night, drink all night, chase a booty call all night. All you got to do is sit in heavenly places. I ain't gonna get no help here. The Holy Spirit comes to remind me of who I am. Come on and give God praise. You are the righteousness. You're his son. You're his daughter. You're his child. You're his king. You're his queen. Come on, give God a high praise. Hey, praise him. 
praise him praise him praise him because you've been made right say yes say yes say yes clap your hands up please oh 